Hello everyone, the day is Thursday, August 1st, 2019, and this is the week in charts. I just want to thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. It looks like we have a pretty good crowd today, so I'm humbled by your presence. So what are we talking about? Well, obviously current market conditions, and I have quite a bit to say about that. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them relative to the current slides. That's to keep my ADD from kicking in. And when we get to the charts, do me a favor. First of all, I'll wait till we get to the live charts before you start asking about individual issues. And when you do, ask about one issue at a time. All right, what are we talk about? Are you making these 10 psychological trading mistakes? What I've been doing lately is because I have so much content out there, and I'm still creating a lot of things, and I still have a lot of ideas and working on a lot of projects, and just a massive amount of things that I want to bring to you. But when I come to these weekend charts, I realize that I've done so much in the past, I need to go back and revisit what I've done. And originally, this came from the Layman's Guide to Trading Stocks. And I was thinking about it this morning. It's, it's a little egotistical, but I think anyone out there who creates, writes or paints or whatever you do, and you go back and you look at some things you did years prior, and sometimes you look at stuff and you go, oh, man, that was crap. But other times you're like, wow, how did I know that then or how did I do that then? And you actually impress yourself. And that's not just me. I think that's anyone who creates. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, to lose money trading was often summing up. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Are you making these 10 psychological mistakes in your trading? Number one, are market conditions favorable for your methodology at the moment? So what does that mean? Well, if you're a trend follower, and by the way, the only way to make money trading is to capture a trend, then take the Rip Van Winkle sleep test. Now that simply means that you look at the market and you imagine that you haven't seen the market in three or four months and you see where the market was three or four months ago. And do the same thing three or four weeks ago, three or four days ago, three or four years ago, etc. And if that market is relatively unchanged over that period of time, let's say a month for a swing to any immediate term trend trader like we are, then maybe that market has lost some steam. Is the overall market about the same as it was a month ago, two months ago, and so on and so forth? And that net-net price change, I think that's one of the most important things out there. Before you start drawing any arrows, just look at the net-net, and then that's going to help you to draw your up arrow, your down arrow, or your sideways arrow. Number two, are you following sound money management? One thing that I've said over and over is that money management will cure a multitude of sin. Recently, I was doing a little writing on the holistic trader. The holistic trader means mind, money management, and the methodology and how they're all intertwined. And it also, there's a fourth element too, which would be you. But getting back to the holistic trader, when I put the learning management system together, the course I took on learning management systems said that just divide everything into three categories. And I said, like, well, those three things, mind, money management, and methodology, don't fit neatly into each category because there's a psychology to the money management. We're taking partial profits, and that feels good. That gives us that short term needing to feel good, and then hopefully, and I just said hope, but hopefully we trail that stop, giving us that longer-term feeling, good feeling, self-actualization, and all those other things that freshman psychology rears its ugly head from the Maslow's ladder to make us feel good about ourselves. And as I often preach, money management will cure a multitude of sins. So if you're only risking a small amount in each trade, then you're willing to shrug your shoulders and move on. I know, easier said than done, but you get the idea. You're not betting your lifestyle 
and I have a crappy day and I get bummed out and everything. And then the way I wrap my head around it at the end of the day is like, well, you did what you were supposed to do. So what? You got stopped out. You lost 2% or whatever the case may be. You still have enough capital to come in tomorrow and trade. So you're down but not out. And the other thing to remember, and this is really, really tough when you're in a drawdown. And in reality, we're almost always in a drawdown. In the process of being a trend trader, you're going to spend a lot of time less wealthy than you were. In other words, you're going to spend a lot of time giving up open profits. And unfortunately, you will spend a lot of time grinding it out where you make a little but didn't lose a little and make a little but didn't lose a little. So a lot of the time, you're going to be less wealthy than you were. But if you can stick with the process, eventually you'll hit it out the park and make it all worthwhile. I borrowed that line from a book about the Kelly formula which if you're trading the Kelly formula, you can get into a lot of trouble because you're making really, really big bets, assuming that you have a fixed edge and you will spend a lot of time being a lot less wealthy than you were. You might knock it out of the park and make a whole lot of money like Larry Williams did years ago using the Kelly formula. He made $2 million in one year, but actually by the end of the year, he was only up $1 million. So, Depends on how you look at it. If you look at it from Larry Williams' perspective, that's the year he made a million dollars. From his wife's perspective, that's the year that he lost a million dollars. So just keep in mind, as we say in the South, that the sun doesn't shine on the same dog's ass every day. So this is especially true as a trend trader. And every time I want to say, every time I say the word trend trader, I want to say, and by the way, the only way to make money is to capture a trend. But again, we're going to spend a lot of time less wealthy than we were. And I hope I have my grammar right on that. But the point being that we're either giving up open profits or we're getting stopped out at a loss. And that's pretty much the name of the game. And then everything in between, especially if we're making a lot of observations, is Oh, we're doing better. No, we're doing worse. Oh, we're doing worse. Oh, we're doing worse. Oh, we're doing better. So there's a lot of up, ups and downs. Now, the next question is, have you lived through a variety of conditions? As I said before, I met a guy all bummed out at a conference, and I tried to console him a little bit. I'm thinking, like, this guy has probably been struggling for years. And he's probably closer than he thinks. And let me give him a little big day of words of wisdom. Hang in there. You're closer than you think. You're probably not as bad off as you think you are. You're probably getting it. And finally, I'm like, how long have you been trading? He goes, six weeks. It's like, oh, geez, okay. Six weeks. Try trading for six years. I didn't have all these feelings. So you want to make sure you've lived through a variety of conditions. That means that as a trend trader, you want to live through an uptrend, a downtrend, and a choppy sideways market. And a choppy sideways market can be really tough because that's when you're really trying to make something happen. Make a little, lose a little, make a little, lose a little. And one thing I've been thinking about quite a bit, trend trading is basically treading water and working hard to keep your head above the water until you, not the mixed metaphors, but until you finally knock it out of the park. So you have to be really, really patient, and you also have to realize that conditions change. When conditions are great, unfortunately, you have bad conditions just around the corner, and the vice versa is also true. So you can't give up. You have to have a solid money management plan in place to keep you in the game. Now, the other thing you have to remember, if you did come out of a great momentum period, and 99 comes to mind for me, and then all of a sudden it comes to a screeching halt, you have to recognize that it came to a screeching halt. You have to be willing to say so long and thanks for all the fish, and then reevaluate market conditions and move on. In, I want to say, I'm trying to think what year it was. I was in, in Italy. 
maybe 2006 or maybe the year after. I went quite a few for every year. For a while, I was going every year and sometimes twice a year or more. I was doing a lot of business over there. But anyway, long story endless, I remember the first visit, it was right after oil prices had a huge spike. I remember when I got home, I saw, I think it was diesel at 4.53 a gallon. And usually in Louisiana, fuel prices are a little bit less than the rest of the nation. I don't know if that has something to do with the refineries being here and uh, all the oil being produced here or whatever. But anyway, I remember thinking how ridiculous that was. But while I was in Italy, I went to awards, an awards presentation, and they were giving out all these awards to the best sector managers. And they would grab their little award, and they'd run up there, and uh, grazie, grazie mille, and they'd go into their little speeches. And I think uh, it was John Bollinger sitting next to me, and I, I said, well, I, I guarantee you, you're not going to see these same guys up here next year. And it was because most of the people up there were energy-related mutual funds, and they absolutely printed money. Why? Well, energy went straight through the roof. That was a year when everybody was screaming $200 oil. So they did really well, but chances of them doing that well the next year are going to be slim and none, and slim just left town. So you got to be careful not to fight the last war. The next question is, do you know your methodology? And if you are printing money and conditions are conducive to your methodology, that's fantastic, but you can't confuse your brains with the bull market. And I think that was a little getting ahead of myself earlier. And I think it was Belsky once said, obviously a rising tide lifts all boats, which is the overall market adage saying that you're in a bull market, everything's doing great. But Belsky, I believe, said a rising tide lifts all egos. And that's where you have to be really careful. And again, you have to be careful not to fight the last war. Now, are you straying from your methodology? If you're a day trader, then fine, day trade. If you're a trend trader, then what are you going to do? Well, you need to trade trends. Don't be buying a market because it's oversold or selling a market because it's overbought or any of that type of reversion to mean type trading or things like that, selling options and crazy stuff. But if you're a day trader, day trade. But if not, if you're a trend trader, then trade trends. Now, the other thing I would encourage you to do is be your own personal benchmark. Your benchmark will be how well you are following the process. You need to compare yourself to yourself and no one else. Don't let the market movements suck you in unnecessarily. And above all, ignore the inflated claims of others. I'm getting better, but as I've admitted quite often in more recent times, these scumbags have really pissed me off. And there are some personal problems that I have with all this. And like I said, I think one's going to jail for embezzlement, not a trading offense, but it obviously shows their lack of ethics in the company they keep, et cetera. But I don't want to digress too far. And you guys can do some Googling and find all this out on your own. But it's hard. Sometimes you see these guys making it look really easy. And unless they have some kind of secret, they don't, that I don't have, that you don't have, then it's not that easy. And I often say the imposter, paraphrasing, what's his name? I forget his name. I've got several of his books here. But paraphrasing him, who, who, I'll think of, who him I'll think about in a little while, <laughs> the counterfeit innovator is wildly confident and the real one is scared to death. Now, I bet you thought I could get through a slideshow, or I bet you didn't think I'd get through a slideshow without saying intuition versus intuition. And that's from, I believe that's a coda from the first Market Wizards. And that's the tough thing. And I get a little full of myself every now and then and feel like, well, I'm Dave Landry. I know this market is headed higher, or this looks like a great trade. Yeah, it's a little bit outside my methodology. It's not a perfect setup, but I need some money, and I think it's good. 
I got to watch out for that intuition versus intuition. When there is a solid trade, it's like I know almost ahead of time I'm going to make money on the trade with an extreme amount of certainty. Now, I do have a little bit of an agreeableness problem, which I'm going to touch upon in one second again. But for the most part, when it's a fantastic looking setup and I get really excited, I, I know with fair with a fair amount of certainty that I'm going to make money. But a lot of times I catch myself into wishing. And usually that intuition or usually that realizing that I am into wishing comes up shortly after I get into the trade and immediately goes against me. And I do that little self-analysis. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, I maybe I didn't do the right thing. I talk about post-mortems often, but one thing I've been thinking about lately is after you get into a trade and the trade's going against you, do a pre-mortem, go back and look at the original trade and ask yourself if you should have taken it. And if the answer is no, I'm not saying exit the trade. I'm saying just tough it out, stick it out, tough it out meaning, tough it out meaning have a stop in place, let the stop take you out if you're wrong or keep you in if you're right. But recognize that one, if you do make a lot of money on the trade or even a little money, realize that you did do the wrong thing and should not have done that. And two, the second thing you're probably thinking, well, why would you stick with the trade if you realize you shouldn't have taken it? Well, it maybe it's just me, but I think that it's a good lesson in torturing yourself not to do that. Go ahead and see it to its fruition. And if it stops you out, it stops you out. Let that be as painful as possible or let that be a painful lesson and you'll do that once and as long as you're learning from your mistakes you're moving ahead and getting ahead in fact and i know there's been a lot of writing lately on the mistake thing almost to a fault to where it almost makes it sound like just go out there and fail well go out there and work really hard to succeed but if you do fail learn something from it and a lot of times you'll learn more from your failures than your success this is especially true in trading where a lot of your successes really didn't teach you anything. And sometimes, and here comes uh, big day preaching, as you know, the market can be a bad teacher and you'll actually learn something that is not a market truism. You'll learn to do something because it made money, because it worked. And in reality, you just got lucky. And that's the hard part, separating the luck from skill, and if you figure that out, write me a letter. <laughs> Dalio, uh, I've been reading some of his book lately. I started off with the audio, Dalio's Principles, and I try to multi-process, and then I realized as human beings, after studying a little neurology here and there, that it's physically impossible for us to multi-process. But in this day and age, sometimes it's hard not to be tempted to do that. And that's why, of course, the texting is so dangerous because people are trying to multi-process and our brains work in a single process fashion. So you're either texting or you're driving, you can't really be doing both. In case you're wondering while I'm on a kick, it's like I've been biking a lot lately and I zip in and out of cars sometimes that are busy texting and they don't even know that a bicycle just went by them. Okay. So I'm I'm super cognizant and I wear a, a hot pink shirt so they can see me when they look up. <laughs> look like a fancy lad riding a bike, but I don't care. I'd rather look like a fancy lad than get killed. But anyway, getting back to Dalio's principles, the reason, see, I did have a point. The reason that I, I got the book was I was listening to the audio and I kept stopping the audio to take notes. And that was interrupting my other work. And I realized that I'm not going to get, I'm going to be bad at getting either my nightly analysis done or listening to this book, I can't do both at the same time. So finally, I got the book, and I'm reading his book. It's a really good book, by the way. You know, I have a lot more to say about that. Okay, number six, have you been trying to outsmart the market? Well, I think we're all guilty of that at some point in time. I've seen a lot of clients when things are going well, and again, that rising tide lifts all egos. But when things are going well, they take my 
recommendations on my service and then they look at the 10 stocks that are in my landry list and end up trading another nine or ten of those stocks even though some of them aren't the best of the best it's just things that i want to watch for possible future opportunities and then the official setups they go ahead and they get in a little bit early and a lot of times they'll take profits or losses depends on how you want to look at it but in some cases they'll take partial profits long before that partial profit is hit or they'll get out at the first signs of adversity and what did I say earlier most of the time as a trend trader you'd be less wealthy than you were then they just generally trying to outsmart the system and sometimes it can really work well the problem is that micromanagement, that overtrading, and all these other bad behaviors, that'll work until it don't. As I often say, a lot of times you could do the wrong thing and still make money, and that could work for a long, long time. So the bottom line, what I'm trying to say is, are you following your plan? Frenchie's laughing at me for calling myself a fancy lad. Hey, nothing wrong with that, huh? <laughs> Pamela says, good morning, Dave. Trying to make something happen. That's very true. Can you advise me on the chart for LK, which is comparative to Starbucks in China? Yeah, I like that stock, or I did, I've been watching it, okay? Yeah, we'll get to that when we get to the charts, okay? I am convinced, Dave, that small amounts are the way to go and only a few stocks at any, at any given time. Well, there's times when, here's the thing, and, and let me be careful not to get too far sidetracked, but yeah, I agree with you. Right now, I can't hardly find a setup to save my life. I've been doing a little ogre trading, which if we have time, we'll get to that in a few minutes. But I really haven't put on that many position trades in quite a while. I think I have three or four in my portfolio, but those were put on, I think the newest one might be two or three weeks ago. But there just really hasn't been a whole lot to do. And I'm going through about 2,000 stocks every day and going through a few lists over and over again, and I can't find anything. So yeah lk that's one of them that did, has been coming up in my scans in my uh, momentum list anyway but yeah a lot of times it's hard not to do anything when there's nothing to do and that we circle back to that intuition versus intuition and then i'm going to touch upon why you have those urges in just a few minutes so yeah keep the questions coming or keep the thoughts coming that's cool now do you even have a plan i just talked about straying from your plan the bottom line is do you even have a plan now one thing i couldn't wrap my head around as i've said a thousand times is why won't people plan their trade and i went for a walk around the block asking myself that question and it came to me the reason people won't plan their trade is the moment that you plan your trade you admit that you could be wrong we don't like to be wrong, okay? I don't like to be wrong. As I've said quite a bit, I think it was Larry Williams' son wrote a book and he talked about a personality test. So I took one and I found out that I had very, very low scores, in some cases zero in certain subcategories on agreeableness. I thought I was the most agreeable guy in the world. Don't you agree? I'm very agreeable, except for the unlightened idiots who don't agree with me. So. I told it to my wife and kids, and they looked at me like I pooed in my pants. They're like, you know, as I often joke, looks the same look they gave you if you walk into Starbucks and say, I'd like a cup of coffee, please. And I know I'm a lot of, a lot of uh, redundant classic Dave Lander here. But the point is that the moment that you plan that trade is the moment that you admit you can be wrong. And we as human beings, especially me, do not like being wrong. And that's one thing that I've wrestled with over the years. And it wasn't until I had that epiphany a few years back that, wait a minute, I have an agreeableness problem, which everybody else seems to know except for me, and that is hindering my trading. And that's, uh, by the way, not to come back to Dalio too much today, but that's one of his points is that when he started taking the mindset of I could be wrong and maybe i don't have all these great traits and please point out my you know imperfections type of thing and be willing to open himself up to that those other thoughts and all is when he started learning 
a lot of things about himself that he didn't know. So it's definitely a journey of discovery, a, a journey of discovering yourself. And it can be a very expensive journey if you're not willing to follow the process until you get it. And then you really want to follow the process. By following the process, you get it. My point is doing something simple, following the rules religiously and nearly mechanically or as mechanical as possible until you're able to add a little bit of discretion and some of these other things I talk about. Now, again, what you could do is mind sculpt that trade, or as I often say, you want to mind sculpt that trade, meaning that you want to see what might happen, look into the future, see what's going to happen or could happen on that trade. Okay, I'm risking 2% of my account. So for every $100,000 in an account, that's $2,000. So what happens if I get stopped out? If I see myself getting stopped out of the trade, well, I'm going to drop an F-bomb, but I should be able to live to fight another day. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day, right? So see that, but also see the position possibly doing well and see yourself taking partial profits just in case that's all you get and allowing the remainder of that profit to evaporate in attempt to possibly capture a longer term trend and also see yourself trailing that stop higher letting it widen out slowly but surely longer term to capture that longer term trend so big fan of this looking ahead mind sculpting type of thing now in the mind sculpting you basically have to come to peace with a bad outcome in advance. So as Annie Duke said in her excellent book, Thinking in Bets, coming to peace with a bad outcome in advance will feel better than refusing to acknowledge it, facing it only after it has happened. Well, unfortunately, a lot of our trades are going to end badly. And I think 50-50 is a pretty good number there. And you tell somebody new to trading and they look at you, again, like you food your pants, when you tell them that you're probably 50-50 as far as being right or wrong as a trend trader. Well, the reality is if you're a pure trend trader, it's a little bit close to 80-20. You're probably 80% wrong and 20% right. And then the actual statistics, which I worked through many, many years ago, seem to come out to be about 72% wrong and 28% right. So you're only going to be right about a third, roughly a third, of the time is a pure trend trader, meaning that you're getting in and trying to capture a longer term big picture move. Well, and your drawdowns are also going to be abysmal, by the way. Well, I've tried to solve for that by being a swing to intermediate term trader. In other words, taking those partial profits and positioning myself to make a swing trade profit. But the reality is you're going to be wrong a lot. So you have to come to grips with that ahead of time. And it's not easy especially if you're someone that's very low in agreeableness. Now, this is one of those cliche things, but are you trading the best and leaving the rest? And Dr. J, I think, is here today. Hello, Dr. J. I over and over ask this question in webinars. Why do the same people who strive for perfection in life settle for such mediocrity in markets? I'm a huge fan of asking questions. If you want answers, ask questions. And what I'm referring to mostly there is you're going to find your own answer, just like I figured out why people don't set stops. But this one really bothered me. And a psychiatrist who's also a client emailed me the answer. And I talked about this in Trading Full Circle. I think it can answer the question about why highly trained and skilled professionals can't seem to get the chart reading slash trading thing. I'm a physician who specializes in psychiatry. Doctors, lawyers, and mechanics are trained to take whatever train wreck comes along and fix it. We're expected to do something immediately regardless of the conditions and despite the possible negative outcomes of our actions. 
as a physician, if you dwell too much on the potential negative outcomes, you will become a deer in the headlights and not be able to function. So we tend to minimize the negative aspects of situations. Waiting for the perfect pitch is not what we are trained to do. So if you're an automatic transmission mechanic, of course nowadays there's a lot more parts changers and automatic transmission mechanics out there, but pretend it was back in the day when people actually still fix things and an automatic transmission mechanic, somebody brings you a, somebody brings you a crappy transmission, you can't say, no, go home, I don't want to fix your transmission. You take whatever train wreck comes along. If you're a doctor and somebody's pretty effed up, I guess as a <laughs> psychiatrist, that's your whole business is dealing with effed up people. You don't wait until somebody with just a little problems comes along and treat them. You have to treat whatever train wreck comes your way. We have no training to prepare us for sitting on our hands and waiting. It is simply not part of the mindset. Sun Tzu is going to rear its ugly head. I, I read a while back. You middle-aged guys, stop quoting Sun Tzu. You're not looking smart. You look like an idiot. <laughs> Everybody quotes Sun Tzu. But basically, Sun Tzu said, if you know your enemy and you know yourself, you need not, you need not fear a thousand battles. Well, this whole business is a business of introspection. There's a lot of getting to know yourself. And if you are a professional, like an engineer or an automatic transmission mechanic or a physician, on top of all of these psychological issues is that your training has created a mindset that is not conducive for trade. You have to turn off that part of your brain and turn on your trading brain. And that's from Dr. J, who I think is here today. Now, one thing I put in last minute is in, on anything less than F, yeah, pass. And, and I have the problem, too. I have the intuition versus intuition problem. And I'm going to get to that in a little more detail in just a few minutes. But if you're looking at a setup and you're feeling like for me, I feel my pulse quick and I get excited. I feel my, oh, I'm taking a deep breath. And I'm like, well, this looks fantastic. I'm, I know I'm going to make money on this. And sometimes I don't. But usually if I'm feeling that F, yeah, I know I'm going to make money on a, on a trade. On anything less, I'm kind of like, eh, it looks all right. I guess I'll take it. Usually on those trades, I end up losing money. So I often say the can't stand the test. If you could... If you just can't stand it, you feel like you have to take the trade, then take it. I think a better way of putting that would be if you're not feeling it after, yeah, then walk away. Now, number nine, are you dealing with any major or not so major life events? Now, when I first put these slides together, I came out and said I might qualify here. And then this morning I added to that, heck, we all do. So going back to when I put this presentation together, this was the pumps on my father when he was in the hospital, and then they added three or four more. This was right around Christmas in 2017, and it was just ridiculous. They added like three or four pumps to this, and I just, you know, it, wasn't, it was no longer funny. Not that it was ever funny, but it was kind of like, okay, that's his Christmas tree. Let's make light of the situation. And then at the same time, I was trying to sell a house. And country property, as I learned, does not sell very quickly. Now, all of this was forcing me to look long and hard in each and every trade. Am I taking this trade to try to fix something in my personal life, or is this a fantastic opportunity that must be taken? Now, here's the dilemma. In trade trading, unfortunately, you must be present to win. So the occasional big home run that comes along, if you're not there, you're not going to be able to, you're going to have a mediocre year. So it's tough. And I always tell people, don't trade around major life events. I went through a drawdown doing some of this. My wife said, you know, you're telling people not to trade around major life events. I'm like, Arr. so it's a dilemma. It's tough because you have to be present to win when it comes to trend trading. But this is when you really have to do that introspection. And saying, am I, am I trying to fix something or is this truly a fantastic opportunity? Which brings me to 
the L.R. Thomas quote, don't expect trading to fill a hole in your life that's missing. And keep in mind that that hole moves. Now, since the original presentation, I buried my father and my mother had been on the same day my father was diagnosed with leukemia and my mother was diagnosed with lymphoma. And then I spent six months between two offices helping take care of her. I buried my mother six months and one day afterwards, after my father passed. My house sold. If anybody's ever sold a house, the last few days you are scrambling like crazy to get all your crap out to fix whatever needs fixing or write the checks or get the repairman in or whatever the case may be. And I went from a thousand square foot detached office where I could scream my F-bombs as much as I wanted to and I've got to get better on that. I'm working on it. To a hundred square foot bedroom. So <laughs> very big, nice, fancy or somewhat fancy office, I should say, to a small little bedroom where if I scream an F-bomb now, people come running my office. What's wrong? It's like, this is what I do all day. <laughs> Go away. And on top of all that, I'm building a house slash new office with all the associated stress. And my wife was just in here 20 minutes ago. Hey, I need your help with this. We need to run to the house. Can you help me real quick? I'm like, no, I'm doing a show. But now I'm kind of thinking like, well, could I have held it real quick? And all it's a little bit, just a little tiny stress sometimes can come and go. But all the stress that I'm talking about is all these monetary holes. It's like 1K here, 10K there. A refrigerator, $10,000. I had no idea. Stove, $5,000. Are you kidding me? <laughs> here a 10K, there a 10K, everywhere a 10K. My contractor's like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's just to be like a you know $1,000. No big deal. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, $1,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he said that a hundred times. <laughs> when we get the final bill, it's not going to be pretty. And some other things that happened. I got to ride an ambulance. I had a surgery due to a repetitive use injury, and I'm going to have to have three more surgeries. So that's a scar. I know you really want to look at my scar, but it's about five inches long, I guess, on my elbow, my other elbow, and uh, has given me some issues too. I have carpal tunnel in both hands from all of this repetitive use. So lots of holes. So like you, I have problems to deal with. And the thing to realize is there's a bunch of little holes, okay? Like my wife just coming in here needing something when I just put on two opening gap reversal trades, the market just opened, I'm trying to get my slides ready, all this going on at one time. And over the course of last year or so, I've had a spirited debate or two with a little lady, maybe three or four. They love you calling that, by the way, all you guys out there. Family matters of dealing with my parents' estate. And there's a business in all this versus emotions. And then emptying a house full of 50-something years of stuff. Kind of a sentimental journey there. And then a drawdown. Okay, maybe more than just one drawdown. And then bumps, bruises, and scrapes, literally and figuratively, worrying about kids running into holes of their own. And believe me, they've had a few since then. So I think it's safe to say that your trading will spill over to your life and your life will spill over to trading. And add to my micro stress, my neighbor just fired up his weed eater. I never thought about people weed eating when I moved into a neighborhood. I'm like, hey, it's just gonna be temporary. <laughs> The other day, I opened up the back door because they're just people just weedy constantly. I hate weedy, by the way. I always pay somebody to do that. <laughs> it's like, stop weedy. <laughs> anyway, your life will spill into your trading. Your trading will spill into your life. Now, I always hate to present problems and not solutions. So I always make it a goal to make sure that I present solutions. So the good news is in number 10 lies a lot of our solutions. So you know what you're doing wrong? Well, you know what you're doing wrong. I love this little cat in the PC. Well, there's your problem. As Livermore once said, a stock speculator sometimes makes mistakes and knows that he is making them. There's that 
introspection again, not an easy thing. So number 10 is, and this is straight from layman's, by the way, you know what you're doing wrong. What is it? I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Romans 7.19. A nice lady a few years back emailed me and said, I feel like Paul. You know that quote about knowing what to do that's good, but not doing it. Knowing what to do or knowing that some things are bad, but doing them anyway. Well, that actually became fodder for many presentations. And I wrote an article for Traders Magazine on just that. <laughs> it's not in the Hebrew tongue. Okay. How would you do it in the Hebrew tongue? In a strong concordance, just saying. All right, I'll have to... I'm not sure where you're going with that. Should I say it in more of a... I want to do what is good. That'll oh, sound British. <laughs> just the strongs. No, it's, it's the meaning. Okay. So, doing the wrong thing made me think about acrasia, and that's something that I've kind of talked a lot about lately. And unfortunately, you're probably going to hear me talk a lot more about it because I've just, uh, yeah, I sound British. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> and I'll probably talk a lot more about acrasia because I think it's an important thing. And I've since learned a few things that can help us overcome acrasia, which I'm going to touch upon in one second. But acrasia is a state of mind in which someone acts against their better judgment through a weakness of will. James Clear defines it as acrasia is a state of acting against your better judgment. It is when you do one thing, even though you know you should do something else. Well, that sounds just like Paul. Acrasia is what prevents you from following through on what you set out to do. And that's from Atomic Habits, and I would suggest that you read it. Now, one thing I was thinking about and this is not my own epiphany. I've read something very similar somewhere, and it might have been in the Atomic Habits book, or actually audio, which I have. I don't have his book yet, but I need to get it. But not doing the right thing now is stealing from your future self. So the problem is we have this time inconsistency. The future self is too abstract by a time inconsistency and I have a whole presentation just on equation time inconsistency but in a nutshell a time inconsistency is if you're offered five hundred dollars a day or five hundred five dollars tomorrow you would take the five hundred dollars today but if you're offered five hundred dollars a year from now or five hundred dollars a year five hundred five dollars a year and a day from now even though it's the same difference in that it's one extra day five bucks most people would take the five hundred and five Dollars. Now, I think that line of reasoning is slightly flawed in some aspects, but assuming that it's truly going to happen, you actually see the money and it gets placed in escrow or something, most of us would take the $5 today versus tomorrow and would be willing to wait the extra day, a year and one day, obviously, for $505 versus 5 bucks. So we do have this time inconsistency, and that time inconsistency rears itself a lot in trading. And if you think about yourself, the future self is too abstract. Someday you want all these things, but that's kind of like this abstract moving target, and it's hard to imagine. Now, one thing they tell you to do is to time travel when taking action today. A good analogy is dieting, okay? And I'm going to diet again. <laughs> and I, I realize it's time we moved from the middle of the country where you couldn't have a pizza delivered and you or anything else. Waiter wouldn't come that far out, obviously. In fact, waiter didn't exist for a, it, until fairly recently. But anyway, there's an extreme amount of convenience where we live. Within a couple of miles of the house, there is a, a dozen fast food restaurants. Well, the closest fast food restaurant from where we used to live was about 35 miles, or at least maybe 30 miles at least. So it was a lot of, it was a commitment to, to behave badly. And that's one thing that I'll probably touch upon in a second is commit to commitment devices. If you want to eat less, if you hear, so here's what you do. If you want to eat less fast food, move out into the middle of nowhere <laughs> and work from home. That way you won't be leaving the house and passing a fast food restaurant. 
But time travel to that future self by taking that bad action today, time travel to the future self and see how that future self will feel. I get up at 45 every day and sometimes in the night I'm thinking, well, I might have a couple of beers. It's like, well, if I have a couple of beers, when I go to wake up in the morning, I'm going to be groggy and not perform at peak performance. Okay, I'm not a holier than now, not that I won't do that, but especially now I'm dieting, I at least time travel to the next morning and embrace how I'm going to feel, and that helps me to make a better decision, usually. And while I'm on the subject of diet, it's like, how will this action affect my future self? I've always been a big guy, but and usually built like a chubby linebacker, but I've got an upcoming speaking engagement in San Francisco. Do I want to be fat AF and SF? So when I'm trying to make that decision, whether to exercise or not, I think about how I'm going to feel in San Francisco. When it comes time to eat the wrong thing or have a beer, I think about how I'm going to feel in San Francisco. So you have to think about that future self. Now, the thing to remember, and this is hard, but you have to realize that the micro is more important than the macro. And one thing that I've been doing, this is, comes from Scott Adams' book, which I have right here. Let me see if I can find it. And it's also in the books to read. And if you check out recent now columns, you can find it. How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big, Kind of the Story of My Life by Scott Adams. He talks a lot about affirmations. And this got me thinking about affirmations quite a bit and I, and I started writing down a few of them and thinking about a few of them morning noon and night I Dave Landry will have a liquid net worth of a gazillion dollars by 2024 my actual number is about six times what I have right now I know it's a little ambitious but do that you have to dream and if you could dream dream big whatever you're thinking think bigger who's that Tony Heish, I don't know how you say his name, S-H-I-S-E. I've got it on a board here. I don't have lit up, so I, don't, I can't read it. But more importantly, do your micro affirmations. The macro affirmations are great, but your micro affirmations is what's going to get you there. That's the conduit, and I think that's a great word to use. So today, I, Dave Landry, will follow my well-thought trading plan. Right now, I, Dave Landry, will not fire off this unnecessary day trade, okay? So have a micro aff aff affirmation saying that, hey, I'm going to follow my plan today, but then have an even more micro one when you feel that siren call to make an unnecessary day trade that you don't take that unnecessary day trade. If you make that affirmation, that's going to stop you from doing it or at least slow you down enough to really think about it. Right now, I, Dave Landry, would take a Ron Papil approach to trading. I put on two opening gap reversal trades today, and my screen went blank. I have my main trading monitor. I have it set to whatever the screensaver is, 10 minutes or whatever. So I don't know what's going on with those, but I do have orders in place. I have orders in place for initial profit targets. One of them did hit it, thank God. And if we have time, we'll take a look at that in just a second. And... One of them did not, so but one of them has an automated tra trailing stop. So there's nothing for me to do with that position. So I'm not going to micromanage myself out of it. I took a similar trade a few days ago in BYND, nice little opening gap reversal. And after I got all my order set up and everything, I went to the gym. And I probably would have done much worse if I'd have sat here and watched it. I would have micromanaged myself out of the position and lost had a losing trade instead of making a little money on it. So in that reaction, you have to ask yourself, are you moving toward or away from your goal? And that's in every action, every micro action, I should say. So if you give into those short-term temptations, you're not going to achieve your longer term goals. If you follow the process, it's going to hurt over the short term, but longer term, you're going to do much better. And who was the, who's the guy that wrote Extreme Ownership? I think it was Jocko Willowlink. I hope I got his name right. 
And his mentality, and I'm not sure if he said this, but his mentality is easy decisions, hard life, hard decisions, easy life. And sometimes it sucks. But following that process is the thing to do, good, bad, and indifferent. Taking that loss when your stop is hit is hard, but it's a thing to do. Short-term temptations can be micromanagement, which can pay off quite well for a while, but then eventually you're going to micromanage yourself out of a big winner. The flip side is following the process, being patient. Let the trend unfold. Obviously, you want to pick the best and not trade for activity. We're all guilty of that. So Coda once said, having a quote machine on your desk is like having a slot machine sitting at your desk. Eventually, you are going to feed it. Now, you're following the process. As I just said, you get stopped out. You get stopped out. You honor your stop. You're giving in to that short-term temptation. You hold and hope. And that's when the market can be a bad teacher again. The stock might just turn around and take off. And you're like, man, I'm glad I stayed with that and didn't honor my stop. Well, that'll work again until it don't. You give up into you give into these short-term temptations by abandoning the plan. You follow the process by following the plan. So the point I'm really trying to make here, drive home, is that the micro is more important than the macro when it comes to trading. So it's very important to follow all these little things that you have to do and don't give in to those temptations. Okay, a couple of thoughts and questions before we wrap it up and get into the live charts. You guys want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to do so. Good morning, Dave. Trying to make something happen. That's very true. Okay, we'll take a look at that in one second. Okay, okay. I can fix Dave that small amounts are the way to go and he only a few stocks at any given time. Yeah, this is what I'm saying earlier. It's not a fortune I make, but it's a little paycheck and all I really expect to make. The market is much too clever for me. Yeah, that's one thing I've been thinking a lot about too is I think a lot about all this stuff constantly. But could I go for smaller returns and be more consistent? And that's something that's kind of in the back of my head too. And it kind of goes against a lot of what I believe in. So I need to kind of wrap my head around that. And maybe the answer is just be more and more and more and more selective. And I think that's going to probably be a different way of achieving the same goal. I don't have anything right now. Everything looks good, but the volume sucks. Uh, I don't know what you mean by the volume sucks. I don't use volume other than enough to make a trade worthy of uh, thick enough to trade. But right now I'm not seeing a lot of things that look great. I think a man has more pride and won't go small. Yeah, you know, look, I on that BYND trade, which turned out to be a, a great day, a great winner. It's a trade I'm very proud of. It was one of the easiest trades that I think I've ever done. And when I went to click into that trade, I clicked in twice the size that I was thinking. Because I'm like, well, this feels good. I think I'm going to do good on this trade. Let me push it a little bit and see what happens. In fact, let me push it by a factor of two. And then it came to my senses and said, no, Dave, trade at the normal size for an opening gap reversal. And, and by doing that, I probably followed the plan because I was trading at a proper size. Had I doubled up, there's probably a good chance I would not have followed the plan because I would have been stressed out about the trade. Problem is, this for a lot of people, this is their retirement. Well, you know, think about your future self, okay? Uh, it, it's, it's, it's like the, it, it, my wife had never seen it, and I said, you've never seen that commercial? It's, it's hilarious. It's the Fabio commercial. It's like Fabio or whatever, and he's he's paddling the gondola. Is that gondola? What do you call those boats? Gondolas? He's paddling and goes underneath the an underpass, overpass, underneath an overpass. And on the other side, he comes out like this old, decrepit man. <laughs> and it says, life comes at you fast. Well, that's a great metaphor for what we're doing. So yeah, if it is your retirement, it's like maybe think of yourself, and God, this is kind of a little horrible, but think of yourself having a really crappy future years. Think of that future self and how you might be taking away from that future self 
by firing off that day trade or not honoring a stop or not honoring a process or trading in less than ideal conditions. <laughs> Feel what a swaggy nigga. Or trading in less than ideal conditions. Or trading when you ain't gonna tell life. These are the things that keep people from becoming a successful trader. I can hear my wife in the other room. She's probably thinking, what the hell is going on in there? Well, that problem is going to be fixed soon. Yeah, I do. A, a, there's a, um, a YouTube out there that I did. When it's like a, it was me pretending to be Daryl Hammond, pretending to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. Daryl Hammond does a really funny Arnold Schwarzenegger imitation. So, yeah, it's a... A lot of people hate the uh, people who don't get me hate it, but it's it's out there. It's pretty funny. It's like Arnold, why aren't there more successful traders? Anyway, you'll have to search for it on my YouTube channel. Thank you. Okay, if you are a gold member of DaveLander.com, be sure and join the Facebook group. I've been having a blast with this group. We've been helping each other out quite a bit, pointing out setups and opening gap reversals and discussing trading psychology and all these things that I preach about. And it's interesting, I've forgotten that I put the subscription in a few weeks ago, but the group is a mastermind group of trend traders seeking to help each other conquer the markets. My ultimate goal when I put together this learning management system was to create a mastermind group and then the Dave Landry Trend Traders Facebook group was kind of a bit of an afterthought, something to get us all engaged and, and just work through some of these things and give me feedback. And But the reality is I've achieved that goal to some extent just through this one thing. But you do have to be a gold member to be a member of Dave Landry Trend Traders. So please join the Facebook group and you do so by clicking right here at the top. This is DaveLander.com slash members, or click on members on the homepage and go there. But first, of course, you have to become a member of DaveLander.com. And it's just a couple of Facebook comments that have come up lately, but it's been really good. So what I'm doing all this is I'm helping those who truly want to be helped. And I think that if we can get together as a mastermind group, I think we can really do well. And if you can get through all the courses, I should say, when you get through because you're motivated, right? And that'll get you up to speed. Anything unanswered, we, we'll cover it in the Q&A. And then I'll add new content, which I constantly do to the back end. And then we'll discuss it in the Facebook group. So anyway, if you really are into it, into it being you want to become a better trader, then become a member, take the courses, attend the Q&A, participate in the Facebook group. And the great thing here is, as I've said quite a bit, I had one guy who's been with me for quite a while and he was making some mistakes and I was trying to figure out what was going on. And he said something about his stop or his money management or risk or something. And I'm like, no, 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 you got that risk all wrong. And it made me realize how many other people like him out there were missing something, even though I teach it and preach it. So that was a big inspiration for this learning management system. And there goes a the neighbor cutting the grass. <laughs> My new office is going to be insulated, and hopefully this won't be a problem anymore. Anyway, so if someone is going through the system now, and I see where they haven't completed the trading psychology or money management is lacking, then I know part of the problem is that they just haven't completed the courses. Anyway, become a gold member today. It's cheap. <laughs> He's got, he should be done quickly. He's got nothing better to do than cut his grass. All right, let me get the short chart share. If you guys want to start talking about individual issues, feel free to do so now. And I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in the overall markets. And then we should have plenty enough time to get to your individual stock picks. Okay, market should go pretty quick here. Let's talk about the peas real quick. Can y'all guys hear that grass cutting? <laughs> I guess this new grass cutting time is going to be 10 or 11 o'clock every Thursday. <laughs> I, I thought this morning, I almost went out and said, look, 
I'll make you a deal. I'll have my yard man cut your grass when he comes if you promise to just stop cutting your grass on Thursdays. I don't know. Anything about that it might be worth, worth my while. Might insult. I mean, that's his hobby, though. He likes to cut his grass. Anyway, SP500. Yesterday looked like the end of the world. One thing I was thinking about, and if anybody wanted to do some testing, I have so many ideas for tests, but there's just not enough time. But one thing I was thinking about is after a Fed day where the market gets whacked pretty hard, I'm wondering if it's like a shaking of the tree and then the market comes right back. Well, so far today, it has. Obviously, we're up about 1%. My big problem lately has been that we really haven't cleared these peaks decisively in the S&P 500. And the problem with that is, take a look at yesterday, it's kind of exhibit A, one big down day, a percent and change, and then you're all the way back to where you broke out and you're back into the sideways soup. But obviously today we're doing pretty good, just off all time high so far, so good. So I'm cautiously optimistic. Now, this is a little bit more evident in the NASDAQ, that breakout coming right back in. As you can see yesterday, we actually dipped below the prior breakout levels. Now, today, fortunately, we're bouncing back nicely and just off of all-time highs. Russell 2000 coming back a little today, but as you can see, faked out yesterday, came back in. As I've been saying, a nauseam in the market in a minute and to my service peeps every day. So far, the Russell still has this big picture retrace look to it, but maybe if we get past 161 and change, we won't have to worry about that too much. Now, dollar took off yesterday on the Fed, I'm guessing. And then as you can see, so far today, having a little bit more follow through. So that's looking pretty good in here. Let's take a look at gold while we're at it. Gold obviously sold off a little bit yesterday, coming in a little bit today. But so far, as you can see, it looks like it's kind of broken out and trying to trend higher in here. Metals and mining got creamed yesterday. Why? Well, when the dollar goes up, commodities, as a general statement, tend to go down because they're dollar denominated. And that would explain probably a little bit of the sell-off we saw in gold and in silver. Now, some of these areas in here such as, oh, I'm sorry, there we go. Metals and mining, got, I, I was on the weekly chart, sorry about that. Metals and mining got whacked yesterday. Coming back a little bit today, I'm long JNUG on an opening gap reversal. And let's see what's going on there. You can see so far, so good on that. And let's take a look at a five minute chart. And in a situation, like this, you allow that opening range to establish yourself and look to get in as it begins to take out that opening range. And then you have a profit target in mind, and then, which is usually your entry down to the low, and then you have a trailing stop. And I'm going to walk through this one in the next Q&A, which is next Wednesday. Now, retail yesterday was a bit of a disappointment because it got whacked. And even though it was pretty far away from its prior little peaks in here, it came almost all the way back to its prior little peaks. So that actually scores as a bummer. And semiconductors were even a bigger bummer. And as I would say quite a bit, I hate it when markets just barely get past their prior peaks because what one big down day put you back into the soup. Now we're coming back nicely today, but let's let's sort of kiss each other just yet. But so far, so good. Overall, things are okay, but yesterday kind of shows you how fast things could change. And then a few days prior to yesterday, or a week or so, I wasn't that excited about the market because internally it looked pretty ugly, and then all of a sudden it started improving. So that's why we take things on a day-by-day -day basis. Okay, let me show you this J. NUG trade when I was thinking. Somebody was talking about it getting along the on this little flag in here. I'm not a huge fan of flags, especially when something takes off. Now, if we get to a market that goes up, down a little, up, down a little, up, down a little, rinse and repeat, then I might change my tune. But usually when a market takes off like this, I like to see a deeper pullback. And yesterday we had a bit of a knockout move. Could have been a little deeper as far as I'm concerned. 
could have been even deeper. But today we had this nice little opening gap reversal. So I like a opening gap reversal or ogre as we call them in the direction of the trend, especially when there's a setup like this. So that's one of my favorite trades to take. All right, the question is, all right, let's go ahead and take a look at some of these charts. LK. Okay, good morning. Let's see LK, which is compared to Starbucks in China. Not that it really matters, but just a little background. T as well, China. Okay. What does this have to do with the price of tea in China? Well, I guess everything, huh? <laughs> um, I'm a big fan of IPOs when they make new highs. Now, I do have a pattern called a buy at D when you're pretty much buying when they make new highs with a few caveats. And one of those caveats is that they also have to take out the range of the first day or close above the range of the first day. Now, if that range was down here somewhere and we had a high higher than it within the first five days of trading, then we don't worry about that. But on the first day of trading, if that first day set the high for the week, they must close above that. Now, the one of the other caveats, and I'm not going to give you all of them. You can get the IPO course if you want that. Shameless little tease and plug, huh? But one of the other caveats is that the price ideally should be less than $20 a share. Now, one thing that I have done to, or something I've discovered subsequently, I should say, is that if you require the low to be greater than the five-day simple moving average and you close at a new high and that closes above the high of day one, that's a cool little pattern to trade. Let me show you one real quick on long GSX on that pattern, okay? So what do we have on this day here? We have closing high above day one, low below, I'm sorry, low above the moving average. All of these things are fleshed out in a lot of painstaking detail in the learning management. I know I'm kind of going quick here, but this is why I'm long this stock on the close of that day. Now getting back to your LK, based on that pattern, you would be long you would already be long from this day here, from that day right there. And let's see what that is. Now, let's say that you want to take this trade as a new trade. What I would recommend you do is wait until the low is greater than the moving average and new closing high. In other words, a repeat signal. I think that might be worthwhile. A somewhat safer thing to do if you're willing to wait would be to see if it can keep breaking out and then look to play a TKL or a pullback. In other words, trade it like you would trade any other setup in the core methodology. Yeah, Pam, you lost me on the on the Hebrew of the Paul thing. If you could email me that, and we'll if I could figure that out. KL. Okay, here's a gold stock. It's so funny, it's like I know I'm shot on Friday, but when their lawnmowers conk out, <laughs> I laugh. It's like, ah, oh, geez. I don't think, I don't think, I don't have to worry about Ed watching my, Ed, the, Ed's a guy cutting grass. I don't think I'm worried about him, me bitching about him, because I don't, I don't think he even knows what I do. I don't think anybody in the neighborhood knows they have a website or anything. I try to fly on the radar a little bit. All right, KL, um, this one looks okay. It, it did come, it's one of those cases where it has to pull back deeply, or I like that it pulled back deeply, but it has to take out the prior. I, I don't like that it took out the prior little breakout in here, but I think overall it looks okay. It's just not jumping out of me as a fantastic setup. I think I'd like to maybe look a little deeper within the goals to see, the find, see if I can find anything else. The other thing too is it's had a pretty good run in here, or a pretty amazing run. I'm wondering, is there something maybe at a little bit lower level, like AG, I don't know if that's silver or not, but you kind of get the idea, something like this, where it's kind of just beginning to take off early in this trend, okay? So, yeah, Sean, I think, yeah, it's a pretty deep pullback. It looks okay. <laughs> it doesn't know you're a celebrity. Yeah, I'm a legend in my own mind. <laughs> We've met some people, and they're like, should we know who you are?
when I was like, no, maybe if you're in the financial industry, you might have crossed paths with them. That's a nice sound, mowing grass? No, that's not a nice sound. <laughs> it's low. You mean the volume overall is low? Maybe. It's like I don't really uh, gauge that. I just look at individual issues. Okay. Any more stock picks? Okay. While we're in the past, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, I will either cover in a Q&A. And if you don't have access to Dave Landry members, then what are you waiting for? No, I'm half kidding. Uh, I'll give you access for that one session. And then anything not requiring a tremendous amount of thought, I will cover in the q and I'm sorry, we'll cover in the next week in charts. All right, everybody have a fantastic weekend. If we don't talk between now and then, and thank you guys and girls so much. Great crowd today. So thank you guys for showing up. Appreciate it very much.